Hello, beautiful souls. It's Kat from Elevate, and welcome to my channel where we talk about recovering from toxic relationships and regaining self love and self esteem. I got a comment on the short I did about this topic. Um, so, someone requested a longer video about it, and I had planned to do that anyway. So, here it is. Um, the big question is why does the abused become the abuser? You know, it's really sad when you see people that you know have been abused and going through a lot of trauma and they're abusing you or other people, and they don't even know it. It's so hard to watch the fact that they don't actually see what they're doing. And it's almost like they're throwing their trauma all over you. And I spoke about that in the short. It's it's like if you become very aware, you can see that they're not actually reacting to you. It's their trauma that's reacting to you. So, you know, it's like coming at you. It's coming right at you. You can't stop it. You can't make sense of it. It doesn't make any sense. And you can see how they're not actually engaging in the present moment. Often they're interacting with you as if you are in a dynamic from their past so that maybe you're, they're, they're engaging with you as if you're a parent from their past or someone close to them from their past that they had an issue with. So, that, so whatever has happened now in the present has hit a nerve that reminds them of something in the past. And now, you know, someone who has developed abusive behaviors will then be triggered and then that you can see that their trauma comes out onto you. So sometimes it's very weird because you can actually see how they're not there with you in the moment. They're reenacting something else that happened to them years ago. The truth is that every abuser was once abused, and that's where they learned the behaviors or developed maladaptive coping skills to cope with the abuse that they had endured, uh, most likely, you know, in their childhood. Could could be in the teenage years, but, you know, a lot of the really heavy, heavy-duty um, damage is done early on in childhood. So... The trauma is coming from somewhere in their childhood and their past experiences, and it's something they haven't resolved. And it could have caused personality disorders or mental illness, you know, and, and then the trauma that you see is like the behavioral representation of those, those um, issues. So there are a lot of things that experiences in childhood can ultimately cause. It could even like I said, be come from like a, a, an early teenage type of painful, toxic relationship that someone was just traumatized from. And it could be devastating to them for the rest of their life. So depending on the age that they experience trauma, they can become abusive to other people because they haven't resolved it. So things like borderline personality disorder, or cluster, certain cluster Bs, or narcissistic personality disorder both occur because of trauma as a child. And that's not always to say it's a parent's fault. It might be one parent's fault, but the other parent was great. And sometimes it could just not be the parent's fault at all. It could just be something that happened to the child from somewhere else. Like maybe they were abused by a neighbor or something. You know, it's hard to know. But often it is from a parent who is maybe abusive so that child is now traumatized and that child becomes an abuser as when they grow up into an, being an adult because there's so many reasons why. First of all, if you think about it, even just children watching behavior and examples of behavior when they're young, they're going to pick up those behaviors as habits because they're going to think, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do because my parents do that. That's how you're supposed to act. So if they had an abusive parent in the home, they just pick up those habits and then they become the abuser, just not realizing that they're taking on the same abusive patterns. Other people might go like the complete opposite way and do 180 on that and become totally different and try to become totally different because they've got more of a self-awareness. But sometimes it's just people take on the habits of their dysfunctional family patterns and behavior from their family. And then this is how abuse just continues and perpetuates things from generation to generation, unfortunately. Um, this is very common. In fact, I think in general, like even if you have a toxic relationship with, with an abuser and a non-abuser together, 
both of them have probably gone through a childhood that included dysfunctional and unhealthy family patterns. Because the non-abuser in that scenario wouldn't tolerate the abuse unless they have been accustomed to that from earlier years. But getting back to someone who is who is like an abuser who was abused, you know, this is generally the case for every abuser. I would say every abuser I think has been abused because it made them into what they are. And unfortunately, in an abusive person's mind, there's a lot of justification of why they do what they do. I feel like... Um, People in general, abusive people will justify and make excuses for whatever they do, either consciously or subconsciously. Some of the people don't know what they're doing. They don't know they're abusing people. I know for sure that certain people with MPD do know what they're doing and other people I think with certain personality disorders or mental illness don't necessarily know what they're doing. Um, so you know, they don't realize how hurtful they're being necessarily to someone. It's it's like um, they have a blind spot. So I think they might have an inclination that they're doing something wrong, but they just feel so justified. And I think that's also the case. I've read some books about this where, you know, these abusers will in their mind have some sort of reasoning, like a logic that doesn't make sense to the rest of us, but to them it makes sense. So they have this kind of cognitive distortion like a set of, of cognitive distortions where they're thinking a certain way and it's not necessarily logical to us, right? It's illogical for us to watch. It makes no sense. So we can't understand because we don't operate from that mindset that they have. It's like, it's like their own magical thinking. So you'll hear this about abusers who will, let's say, you know, like beat their wives, but they would never beat their mother. And they have this like magical reasoning, logic, like, you know, it's okay to beat their wives because she made them do it because whatever she did, the wife, but they would never do that to their mother because that would be so disrespectful. So you can, you, we can see that from a healthy minded person, this makes no sense, but in an abuser's mind, there's a cognitive distortion where they actually believe these things and then they take actions based upon this. So... The tragedy of the abused being an abuser is that they have learned a lot of dysfunctional thinking patterns that will be hard for them to break to get healthier and stop abusing people. And like I said, some of them don't have any idea their thinking is even off. A couple things that can be going on is if someone who's abusing everyone, most likely they've taken on these abusive tendencies and these abusive behaviors and they are in their own right an abuser. You know, if they're just abusing one person back in reaction to, let's say, that person's abuse, then that's reactive abuse. And it's not necessarily that the person is a, an abuser per se, but it's kind of in a, in, a, in a way, at the end of the day, it winds up being the same thing. Like someone who is abused becomes an abuser. It's like you can you can apply this to reactive abuse as well. But this video is more about a person who's actually turned into an abuser because they were abused and they're continuing to abuse other people, not just reactive abuse. Um, you know, there's so many things that can happen to kids, you know, like emotional, physical abuse, an emotionally unavailable parent or abandonment, which can all cause trauma that, you know, will possibly result in someone becoming an abuser when they become an adult. But any kind of abandonment when they're younger, if their parents even just got divorced, some, sometimes a young child can take that on as abandonment, even though technically it wasn't. And maybe the parents are both still around, but that just felt like abandonment. And now this child's growing up with a wound that's caused them to develop some sort of personality disorder or taking on the abusive behaviors of possibly the parent that was more abusive and dysfunctional. And they're just perpetuating that. So, I, I mean, the only way to actually solve this is they, you know, as an adult, someone who is abusive needs to go to therapy and then, you know, possibly get on medication depending on the issue. Um, but I find in my experience with toxic people that you know, toxic and abusive people don't want to do that. They don't want to go to therapy. They, 
they, they often blame everyone else and they don't want to look at themselves. So, you know, most of the time they're in such a deep denial. There's such a deep unwillingness to actually look at what they've done that they'd rather just live in denial and continue in their dysfunctional ways because they literally, I think a lot of them, they just don't see it. It's like I said before, a blind spot, like they really can't see it. And they might see a little bit that they're, they're not, you know, I think they have some sort of morality usually where they would know that something's off, but they just justify what they do based on these cognitive distortions. So they justify away any, any, um, I guess, kind of um, not remorse, but any kind of doubt that they're correct, any kind of self-doubt. I think they erase with the cognitive distortions that they, that they use to justify their bad behavior. So I don't believe they can generally see it as much as other people can from the outside or healthier people that can see it and they're trying to bring it up. And then of course they're going to be angry at you. So, you know, they get very angry at you when you bring it up, even if you just mention the condition at all, um, or, you know, Hey, like maybe you should go to your doctor. You know, I, I've had experience with people that they just get very angry because they don't want to feel like anything's wrong with them. And they don't realize that they're actually, not only are they hurting and abusing other people, but they're actually at the end of the day, hurting themselves more than anyone because they're living inside denial and that's not reality. So they're actually effectively denying reality and not realizing, you know, in the long run, their life is not going to be great. You know, they, they're not going to be able to achieve the dreams they want to achieve. They're not going to be able to live the life they want to live because they can't, because at some point this issue is always going to kick up. And unless they're resolving it with a professional, it's always going to hold them back. It's it's always going to, you know, sabotage them. So for the woman who put a comment in, in wanting the longer video, she said she thought her daughter might be in this situation. And, the, and so the difficulty with having a child like this I think the danger is that the mother can become an enabler for the child, the grown child. And it's so hard because you love your child. You want the best for your child. You want your child to be happy, right? I mean, everyone, well, every good parent, I would say, wants their child to be happy. But in this situation, it's enabling the child if you continue to sweep under the carpet or just placate them when they rage. I think even some parents are afraid of the rage of their child who is an abuser. I've seen that before. So enabling also includes making excuses for them. Um, Even if you protest when they, you know, act poorly, um, you know, we often protest. Like we say, uh, like, no, I don't want to be treated this way. That's like protest behavior. It's like, you know, a lot of codependents will stand up for themselves and kind of say that. but. the problem is that they don't stick with it. So that's a boundary. You know, you're putting up a boundary, right? Um, you're saying, I don't want to be treated like this or, or I won't accept treatment like this. But then and the problem is, especially if it's a parent or a partner of the abuser, is that they, they back down on that. They back down on their own boundaries. They don't stick with it. It's very common for a parent or a partner of an abuser to be codependent and to be an enabler. So if you have a child who's being abusive to you or other people, you have to stick to your boundaries and really hold them firmly. And that's so hard because it's your child and you don't want to have conflict. You don't, you don't want to hurt them. You know, you love them. You want them to be happy. But unfortunately, abusive people need the consequences and they need professional help. And, you know, they definitely need to go to therapy. They need like, like I said, possibly medication, but the least they need therapy because a lot of times they just cannot see what they're doing. And no matter um, what you do, they're not going to see it. I think um, some of these people who have like explosive anger and rages, uh, I've seen where they go on antidepressants and that seems to help them at least 
help with their anger to bring the anger down. And then they can actually maybe go to therapy and figure out like um, what they need to do as, as a plan. But obviously, you know, it's not for everybody. Um, you know, but that could be a start where you're not, at, you know, at least that person's not having explosive anger. Then then they can sort of try to see them, see um, if they can, you know, let's say do some sort of behavioral techniques, cognitive tools in therapy in a more chilled out state. But like people that have like rages and anger issues and stuff like I've, from what I've seen, they can't really benefit from therapy unless they're on some sort of medication because they really need to like chill so they can actually absorb what's going on in the therapy not everybody's the same, right? But this is like personally my life experience and what I've seen. Um, depending on what kind of trauma they have. So it could just be a, like the abuse could be a learned behavior. Uh, it could be a personality disorder. It's, it's hard to know. So they really need to go to therapy to figure that out. And as a person on the outside and the person who's dealing with the abusive person, it's so hard because you want to have compassion and you want to help this person. But at the same time, you have to have a boundary and realize they have to help themselves. So my heart goes out to you if this is your child, because it's extremely hard to watch your child go through something painful, not making the best choices, um, let's say, to get themselves help. And all you can do is encourage them. You know, you can't change her and you can't make her go. And unfortunately, I mean, unless she's a minor, then you can make her go. But if she's an adult, unfortunately, she's got to, got to make that decision herself. And, um, so there's like different things. They could do CBT, there's DBT therapy. There's so many different kinds of therapies. So she would need to get assessed by a professional to see what's really going to help her. But essentially she's got to change her mind that she's, you know, grown up now with all these concepts, like perceptions that are dysfunctional for whatever reason, you know, she's now in her mind, you know, has these perceptions that, she justifies the abusive behavior in her mind. So it's it's actually like she needs to uh, change how she thinks. And there's no way you could do that on your own. I mean, maybe some people could, but I, I, from what I know, that would be very, very rare. But, um, you know, you have to hold your own boundaries as a parent and not feel you're responsible for her if she's an adult. But be su as supportive as you can, as best you can, so she knows that someone's there for her. I definitely think you should make it known that you don't agree with the behavior, because if you don't make it known that you don't agree with the behavior, then you're enabling her. And that's not good. But you can't change her. And she has to take the initiative to do so. And she might be really angry at you, you know, for ever like suggesting any of this or talking about any of this, usually like you know, the, like just talking about this kind of thing will trigger these people um, to fly off the handle. And that's to be expected pretty much. Um, and that can be scary. And it can be scary to, and if you feel unsafe, you definitely should not do that. If you feel like, you know, you're in danger, I would not do that. Or I would do that in a safe place where you're, you know, with people that, you know, it's a safe environment to do so. But, you know, if you're ever feeling in danger, don't bring up these volatile topics with someone who feels actually dangerous to you. I don't know what your daughter's situation is, but, you know, it's very sad and tragic when people are in this situation because you want to help them. You want to, you want to save them. You want to feel like you can help. And it's, it's like, uh, you can't, you know, um, I, I have a friend that I talked about in the, on the channel before, the, like a few friends that I had to cut off. One of those friends, it was one group of people, one of those friends, um, you know, I can't be friends with him anymore because it's too damaging and he doesn't take care of his trauma. So his trauma is like thrown around on everybody, his family, his friends, and like he doesn't seem to see it. It's this very situation. you know, literally doesn't see it. So it's, it's like, he's also seems codependent. And I think, um, in my opinion, 
borderline personality disorder. So you can be codependent and borderline. You can also be codependent and narcissist at the same time. You know, it's not always uh, codependent is the opposite of narcissist. It's not always the case. The the narcissist um, and other personality disorders can also be codependent in a different capacity. It's it's not played out necessarily in the exact same capacity. I think the codependency as the non-toxic partner who may be codependent, um, but there is a level of codependency between both partners, I believe. So the codependency is different in both scenarios, but um, you can still be codependent and be both of those things. Uh, you know, the codependency though, is not going to be that person's biggest issue. Like if you have narcissistic personality disorder, or any cluster B personality disorder, or any mental illness, codependency is like a minor issue in comparison to the bigger issue. Um, if you're being abusive to people, that's obviously the bigger issue. That's the issue to focus on. The codependency piece can come later. Uh, but it's frustrating. And I can imagine as you being a mother, it's super frustrating because you want to help your child. And I get it because I'm a mother as well. You want to make everything okay, but you can't. And actually sort of holding your boundaries, not enabling her to walk all over people will actually in the long run benefit her because maybe it's going to help her realize that she can't continue on like this. You know, if enough people hold their boundaries with someone like this, they may hit rock bottom. They may realize they have to change. But if abusive people just continue getting enabled by family and friends, then they will just continue walking all over people, traumatizing other people and living in their little world of denial where they justify everything and all the abuse that they do towards others. And that's not good for anybody, them included but they don't know that they're they're blind most of the time unless they have narcissistic personality disorder they might know what they're doing then um it depends on like the type of narcissist i believe so i feel like though there's a lot more people out there who are traumatized and abusing other people that don't have a real awareness of what they're doing and they just keep blaming everybody else you see this a lot it's it's like they have a lot of characteristics i've noticed Um, Like they don't take accountability. They don't want to face shame or actually own up to things they did wrong. They feel very entitled. There's like a level of entitlement that's strong and very noticeable. You know, and as I said before, they justify a lot of their behavior. So they come up with reasons, reasons which to us don't make sense. But to them in their mind, it's a distorted pattern of thinking that they've created that justifies their behavior. They have a lot of insecurity usually. They may believe they're unlovable. They're afraid of abandonment and sometimes closeness as well, depending. Uh, They don't trust people. So I hope that this helps. I really think that your daughter will need to get some professional help. And I wish you all the best and her as well. And I would say to just hold your boundaries and just be supportive of her and encourage her to get that help because you're not going to be able to get her to see what she's doing on your own. It's it's not going to work, but you have to just be careful you don't enable her so that she just continues to live in denial. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe by pressing the bell icon and please share this video with your friends who may need this message.